Hey, what's up there, YouTubers? Adjman Sinna Drop can be you guys here today with another deck tech. So today we're taking a look at a standard deck, and it is Naya Zoo. So Naya is a color combination of green, white, and red, and with the Zoo archetype for the deck, uh, it's typically an aggro beatdown deck that focuses a lot on playing creatures, getting a massive board presence, and then just being able to turn them sideways and swing at your opponent and just get them to zero as quick as possible. Uh, with the Zoo archetype as well, it's going to be playing some... Uh, kind of flavorful creatures that also bear a animal subtype to them somehow like in this deck we're running boars we have elephants um minotaurs as well like there, there's just like some some funny things to it there's there's obviously like non-animal based stuff as well where we're playing like humans angels and devils as well so um it's kind of like hit or miss with uh zoo but it's it's basically uh, it's basically an aggro beatdown deck, and with Naya, we definitely have the early early board presence things that we can play and just smack down our opponent before they even have a chance to be able to respond massively with anything. So uh, we're going to take a look at this deck, but if you guys have any suggestions for decks that you would like to see, please leave them down in the comments below. But the first thing that we're taking a look at here is the land base. So we want to understand how our lands are going to be looking for this deck. So we're running 23 lands, starting off with our shock lands being a playset of stomping ground. Uh, we also have a playset of temple garden. I'll try to straighten things up because I'm very OCD here. There we go. That's somewhat all right. Uh, we have a playset of sacred foundry as well, providing red and white. And then we have our other dual lands here. We have a playset of Rootbound Crag. And then we have a playset of Sempetal Grove. So those are our dual lands that we have. And then we just have one single Kessig Wolf Run to be able to siphon mana whenever it comes to mid to late game. And we can swing Alpha and just have a big bulky creature for us uh, that's going to get a plus X plus zero buff depending on how much mana we put into it and trample. And then we just have two basic mountains. So uh, out of the... Mana production, uh, red and green is definitely really stressed here, and those are the two main colors that we have in the deck. Uh, white is also fairly prominent in this deck as well, but red and green is definitely the bulk of the creatures and the spells that we have to cast here. Um, but ultimately, our mana base ends up working pretty well. We're not running clifftop retreats because we don't want to, and we don't have the need for it. Uh, we don't want to uh, end up adding in more dual lands that are unnecessary just because we have the things that provide green for us um, and we have the things that provide red for us and it's okay to have our one set of dual lands that are not going to be providing green as as well as the three other lands that are not going to be providing green for us um, but ultimately ends up working out really well it's a consistent way to actually have things like turn one Addison's pilgrim and uh, be able to play off of it from there and still have our really good plays um, from that point on. So uh, now let's take a look at everything else that we have in the deck. So uh, speaking of which, uh, we have our Abyssin's Pilgrim right here in uh, taking a look at creatures in ascending order. So we have him. He's a 1-1 one, one for 1 green, and he taps to add 1 white mana to our mana pool. So Abyssin's Pilgrim lets us accelerate along, and he lets us play essentially a turn earlier than what we would normally be playing. So uh, I think my favorite thing to do in this deck, and uh, it, it happens a decent bit, it's it's not always like exactly the same thing that goes on each and every time, but um, if we're playing up against a uh, Naya matchup where it's just a mirror or like a red deck wins deck or Boros or something like that, uh, whenever we play up against it, if we can go turn one Abyssin's Pilgrim, if it sticks and they don't remove it with like Pillar or something like that, um, during our next turn, we play Lexidon Smiter. And then during the following turn, we play Volcanic Strength. I think that is my favorite thing to do in this deck uh, as far as ramping with Addison's Pilgrim goes. Uh, because in the Naya and the Red Deck Wins matchups, they can't deal with that. They cannot deal with Luxodon Smiter having another plus two, plus two buff put onto him and then having Mountain Walk. Uh, it's really strong because Naya only has the means of getting rid of Luxodon Smiter via Mizium Mortars. And then when we're also putting on a buff onto him, it he just gets really huge. And Red Deck Wins only has Searing Spear as far as instant speed goes. So it's even it's even better. So uh, we end up having a 6-6 six, six on turn three that cannot be blocked by our opponent's things, which is so sick. So uh, to move along, Addison's Pilgrim is awesome. 
Uh, we have Burning Tree Emissary, and this is a three of in our deck here. So uh, it's a two two for double hybrid gruel, red or green. And whenever it enters the battlefield, we add red and green to our mana pool. So essentially, if we're going off of playing this and then playing like another card that we can cast like right after it, um, it's it's just the Billy Maze card. Like, all right, well I'm playing uh, Burning Tree Emissary, but wait, there's more because I'm playing more things. So. Uh, I like Burning Tree Emissary. It actually ends up siding out for Centaur Healer whenever we're playing up against like stuff like Red Deck. So three of these side out for three Luxodon, or <laughs> Luxodon, three Centaur Healers, and um, we end up gaining life off of the Centaur Healers. And uh, we also have no creatures that are smaller than uh, three threes as far as the bulk of our creatures goes. Uh, Addison's Pilgrim is the one exception that we have to that, but the rest of our creatures are going to be three and higher in power and toughness, so that's pretty solid. Um, then we have our Flint Hoof Boar, which is a 2-2 two, two for 2, which actually is a 3-3. Three, three. Uh, so it gets plus 1, plus 1, as long as we control a mountain, which eh, pretty much is almost always going to be the case. There are some exceptions to that, and there's some situations where you just don't get uh, like a mountain, a sacred foundry, or a uh, stomping ground there, but um, pretty much nine times out of ten, the Flinthoof Boar is going to be a three-three. Uh, it's it's more times than none that he's going to be a three-three. So uh, essentially, we're going to have a three-three for two mana. That for one red mana, he can gain haste until the end of the turn, which is pretty solid. So uh, overall, it's a it's an early threat that we can get out onto the board and we can just swing on our opponent really easily. So uh, play set of Flinthoof Boar, pretty pretty standard there. Uh, we have our Boros Reckoner, so he's a 3-3 for triple hybrid uh, Boros, so red or white. And whenever he is dealt damage, um, he deals that much damage to target creature or player, so he gets to kind of like redirect it. Uh, he still takes the damage, but then he gets to redirect that much damage to either a creature or a player, uh, which is pretty nice. And for one red or white, he gains first strike until the end of the turn, which is nice up against other creatures, so... He can have first strike, and your opponent just can like sit back there and be like, "All right, well, I have to chump, so I might as well." Um, and Boris Reckoner is just just awesome. He he really gets the job done. He's such a perfect creature to have in this deck, and uh, it was not any surprise to me that people would be using him in so many decks. And uh, whenever he was first spoiled, I was like, "This guy is pretty nuts," and he ended up just being just as much nuts as I thought he was going to be. So love Boris Reckoner in this deck, and. Uh, love using him. Uh, then we have Luxodon Smiter, so another 3 drop, 4-4 four, four for 3, can't be countered, and if a spell or ability an opponent controls causes us to discard him, he's going to be put onto the battlefield instead. So mainly like Liliana of the Veil vale, um, or Rakdos's Return. Rakdos's Return is still played in um, Jund as well as Liliana. Liliana's played in Jund as well. Uh, so those are like the two big ways that he gets discarded, but ultimately... Um, He's pretty much just a 4-4 four, four for 3 that can't be countered. So that's pretty good up against control because they can't counter him. Uh, then moving along, we have Hellrider. So I love having Hellrider in here. And a lot of decks have been actually playing Thraktusk as a 5-drop um, in this deck. And instead, I actually wanted to run Hellrider in here because he lets you be so much more aggressive. Uh, so he's a 3-3 three, three for 4 haste. And whenever a creature you control attacks, he deals 1 damage to the defending player. Um, so that... Damage that he's actually dealing can be redirected to a Planeswalker if you so choose. So you can kind of like divide that up by each trigger that's being put onto the stack uh, for each creature that's attacking. But ultimately, Hellrider is nuts. He's so nuts in this deck, especially if you have a really good board presence. If you're playing off of like your Emissaries and you're getting like free things, like you go Emissary, Flinthoof Boar. Uh, then you play like another dude like Reckoner or Luxon Smiter and then play Turn 4 Hellrider and you just swing Alpha he really gets there. He he ends up just dealing a whole lot of damage. So I love having Hellrider in there. Um, and then we have our last creature here, which is Restoration Angel, which is pretty awesome in here as well. So 3-4 for uh, 4 with Flash and Flying. And whenever it enters the battlefield, you may exile target non-angel creature you control and then return that card to the battlefield under your control. Uh, so with Restoration Angel, uh, it essentially is going to kind of like nullify any removal spells your opponent may try to use on you when you have that four mana open. Like you swing uh, with Luxet on Smiter and your opponent tries to respond with like Abrupt Decay or something like that. Sure, you won't actually get the damage through, but you play Restoration Angel, you bounce your 
um, well, blink, to use the proper term. You blink your Lexidon Smiter, and they essentially don't get that abrupt decay to resolve on it and get rid of it, and you still have your Lexidon Smiter, and you have a 3-4 Angel with uh, Flash and Flying that's going to be bashing in as well. So uh, definitely like Restoration Angel. The, the biggest use out of it is just being able to kind of nullify any target type spells. So I definitely like that. Uh, then we're working our way into non-creature spells. Uh, so first off, we have Faith Shield. So uh, I'm running two Faith Shield in here, which is going to give target permanent we control uh, protection from the color of our choice. So this is going to be uh, essentially kind of like what we have Restoration Angel for. It nullifies other uh, target spells. So if our opponent plays something like... Um, if they try to play like Tragic Slip on one of our creatures, if a Morbid... Um, has triggered if if a creature has died and morbid would get rid of our creature um, by any other means. We can respond with faith shield, give our creature protection from black, or if it's like abrupt decay, we can give it protection from green or black. Um, when it comes to uh, red deck wins, if they're trying to play like searing speed, uh, searing spear at instant speed on our creature, we can respond, give it protection from red. Uh, the other nice thing about Faith Shield is that protection from uh, that given color is also going to make our creature unblockable against creatures with that same color. Uh, so that's definitely nice with that if you're playing up against like Red Deck Winds. They try to get rid of your creature like uh, Hell Rider if you have Hell Rider and they say, all right, well, I'm going to Searing Spirit before you enter combat. So like you don't get your triggers. You, you don't have the Hell Rider's ability to trigger off and... Uh, you get all of those um, instances of deal one damage. Well, you can just respond with face shield, give a protection from red, and you just get the swing in. Hellrider is going to swing in unanswered, and his triggers are still going to go on there. So love faith shield, protection from creatures, protection from colors that are targeting, really awesome. The only thing you want to pay attention for is if you give your creature protection from red, make sure it's not enchanted with volcanic strength because... Uh, creatures with protection can't be enchanted with uh, enchantments of said color. So that would kind of just defeat the purpose. Uh, but other than that, Faith Shield is awesome. Love Faith Shield in here. So speaking of which, Volcanic Strength is in here. Uh, I'm running it as a two of in the main board, and I also have one more in the sideboard. So Enchanted Creature gets plus two, plus two, and has Mountain Walk, which makes it unblockable as long as Defending Player controls a mountain. So like I explained before, if you're playing up against like Red Deck Winds, if you, if you play Volcanic Strength on something like Luxodon Smiter or Restoration Angel, it's it's very close to them just scooping. Um, because you have a 6-6 six, six that they can't deal with. Um, in this case, you have a 5-6 that they can't essentially deal with either. So you end up having just a, an immense creature that their Searing Sphere can't get rid of. Um, Mizium Mortars isn't going to get rid of it because it's at a sorcery speed. So they end up just not being able to do very much. So I love Volcanic Strength in this deck up against Red Deck Winds. Uh, up against the Naya matchup, um, the Mirror matchup, it's kind of like a little bit more tricky because they definitely have the removal and they can just get rid of your stuff before you even have a chance to um, enchant anything. Um, but for the most part, the Naya decks have been running Mizium Mortars and not Searing Spear. So you're a little bit more safe at not being able to get two for one as far as the, the matchups go. Um, but if your opponent's tapped out, Volcanic Strength is even better because you don't have to worry about getting two for one and them getting rid of your creature before it gets enchanted. Uh, but Volcanic Strength is just really nuts. It's it's such a dumb enchantment. It's so good. It's, it's just amazing. Um, and then we have our spells. We have our Searing Spears. So I'm running two of them. Uh, so it deals three damage to target creature or player for two mana. Um, I'm actually surprised that more of the Naya decks aren't running it. I could I could see why they wouldn't be running it, but at the same time, I think it's a really good value to have it in here because it deals with things at instant speed, uh, especially if they're trying to like enchant something with Volcanic Strength. And it also deals with a lot of early game things that other aggro decks would have. Uh, we can just get rid of stuff outright and not have to worry about it. So I like the Searing Spear as a two of in here. And then we are running the play set of Mizium Order. So it deals four damage to target creature you don't control and overload for six. Uh, three generic and triple red to uh, deal four damage to each creature we don't control. Uh, we normally want to win before we get to the point where we have six mana open, but if if we're really just locked with the board state and it's just nobody's doing anything, Mizium Mortars gets there pretty easily. So uh, I like Mizium Mortars for that. So that's the main board that we have here for this deck. 
All right, so now let's take a look at this sideboard here. So like I mentioned before, when talking about the main board, uh, I mentioned that we have Centaur Healer in here. So there's the three Centaur Healers, uh, three, three for three, enters the battlefield and we gain three life. Um, like I mentioned before, the Burning Tree Emissaries side out for the Centaur Healers more times than any like anything else. Um, but I like having the healers instead of the Burning Tree Emissary because like up against like Red Deck wins, Emissary does nothing except get his board presence, and that board presence is very unimpressive. Um, so I actually like having the healer over that because it gains us back life, and it's still a 3-3 body for 3, which is pretty solid overall. Uh, then we have Ray of Revelations as a 2 of. So destroy target enchantment for 2 mana and a, a flashback for 1 green mana. And with Ray of Revelation, it helps us out against playing... Um, against the Detention Spheres, Oblivion Rings that our opponents may have, as well as Blind Obedience, because Blind Obedience is a really huge thing, and it restricts us from using um, any of our haste things, as well as uh, not having blockers up against other aggro decks, which is kind of troublesome. Um, so we have Ray of Revelation there to be able to deal with uh, pesky enchantments. So, uh, moving along, we have Domri Raid as a 2 of. So, Domri is here for the, uh, for the mirror matchup and also for being able to play it in uh, the control matchup. In the control matchup, it lets us dig, which is really, really useful. Uh, with the plus one, we look at the top card of our library. If it's a creature, we can reveal it and we can put it into our hands. So, it kind of helps us out. It's like we're drawing uh, if we keep on having consistent creatures on top. Uh, the minus two lets us fight target creature, like uh, one of our creatures with one of their creatures. So it's like having a removal in the mirror and also against red deck wins. I really, really like having Domri there um, just because um, we're able to fight things and give our opponent less things that they can actually block with. So Domri is really strong for that. Um, then we have Boros Charm. So Boros Charm is up against decks that have like a lot of heavy removal. Uh, I also like using it against control so they don't have the advantage of being able to play like turn four uh, Supreme Verdict and Wrathing us and get rid of, uh, getting rid of all of our stuff. So Boros Charm is kind of like the, oh, well, uh, my dudes are indestructible, GG. Like, uh, Boros Charm is really good. I Pretty much against anything that has a lot of removal that they can use to get rid of our creatures, I'm going to side Boros Charm in against it. Um, and it gives us widespread indestructible for all of our creatures. Uh, we have one more volcanic strength, like I mentioned in the main board discussion. So it uh, gives a creature plus two, plus two in Mountain Walk, which is really good up against decks that are running a lot of uh, mountains or uh, shock lands that involve mountains. Uh, so volcanic strength ends up being a potential win condition. It's kind of like a slow win condition, but it's a win condition. Volcanic strength can get there. It's really strong. Uh, we have two Pillar of Flame uh, for any of these small creatures. Uh, especially with things like Stromkirk Noble, because Stromkirk can end up getting pretty big pretty quick. And also Ash Zealot, because there's nothing more annoying than you swinging with, like, Smiter, and you're thinking, well, all right, he, all he has is a 2-2. It's no big deal. And then you get Searing Speared uh, on your Luxon on Smiter, and they get first strike damage and kill your Luxon on Smiter before it deals four damage to you. Pillar of Flame is nice up against early game. Uh, creatures that your opponent opponents may have and it's pretty useful on that um, and we also have our three rest in peace here so pretty much with almost like all of my decks that are running white i like to have three rest in peace because it's consistent um, even if our opponent gets rid of one of them we can consistently get another one as opposed to like having two where like we have one and then it's it's kind of like a crap shoot to get the other one if we really need it but uh, there's a peak in when you want to play it. You don't want to play, like, right from the start of the game, like, oh, turn two, rest in peace. Like, uh, that's really not going to do anything. You want to have that optimal time to play rest in peace when they already have some things in their graveyard, but they're just, like, one step away from comboing off, like, one turn away. Then you play rest in peace, get rid of their graveyard. If they deal with it, good for them. If they don't, then uh, they're not going to be able to combo off. But the combo decks are really annoying, so I want to have rest in peace... Uh, in there to not have to worry about them. So that is the main board and the sideboard here for this Naya Zoo beatdown deck. So if you guys enjoyed it, please be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe for more Magic the Gathering content. The entire deck list is down below where you guys can check it out. And please be sure to check out the playlist in the description where I have all the previous decks that I've actually covered on the channel. Uh, until next time, guys. Uh, I hope you guys subscribe and uh, check out some more videos that are going to be coming out. But until then... Have yourselves a wonderful, fun-filled Magic the Gathering day.